Jewish values in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, heavy topic, which rabbis of several synagogues have embraced to bring this difficult topic into a safe environment for people to gather over Zoom and learn how to discuss this matter in a different frame of mind, values over opinions. I'd like to thank the synagogues Bet Shalom, Bethel, Adath, Maim Rabim, Temple Israel, and Shir Tikva for partnering with us, the Federation and JCRC, on this whole framework, which began in the fall and continues through spring. I'd also like to thank the Israeli consulate in Chicago as always being willing to support Israel-related programs we bring to the community. And I think it's important for folks on this call to know that we have their support, even though they're not on this call. So a few housekeeping notes. This is a Zoom. It's a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar format so that we can maintain a community kind of feel even though we cannot meet in person. On the top right corner, you will see a grid-like icon. And with this, you can choose if you want to see a gallery view and see other faces of some of your friends who you don't see every day or speaker view and you will see the speakers which Sammy will be spotlighting. You can also toggle back and forth with these options however you feel comfortable with. Please keep yourself on mute and feel free to post questions in the chat. When we get to the discussion part, we'll have time to address some of these questions as well. I'd also like to thank our ASL interpreters, Nicole and Ali, who are here to serve those who need this assistance. Following Micha's talk, Rabbi Rappaport of Shir Tikva will come up and lead a discussion. Thank you very much, Rabbi Rappaport, for being willing and able to partner with us on this. And now I'd like to invite our very special guest, Micha Goodman, from Israel. I won't go into the whole biography because we've promoted it and you can find many more things if you Google, but I do want to say on a personal note, I've heard him speak many times, both in Hebrew and in English, and I've always enjoyed his talks, which have always given me things to think about for a few days afterwards, and it's a great way to head into a new week. If you've not read his book, Catch 67, I highly recommend you do so. And if you want to talk about it and can't find anyone in the community to talk about this book, I'm always up for a discussion on this book. And he has a new book out in English. It's been out in Hebrew for a while, but it's now translated. And it's called The Wandering Jew, Israel and the Search for Jewish Identity. For the Hebrew readers, it's Chazara uh, Blichuva. And um, this is also a book that I highly recommend reading. And if you want to have a discussion, perhaps this is something that maybe Micha would be willing to talk about in the future. So without further ado, please welcome Micha from Israel to our snowy Minneapolis. Thank you, Micha. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be with all of you in your snowy Minneapolis morning. This is evening, a little bit nice and cool in Israel. Robert Putnam from Harvard just finished uh, writing a book. One of his chapters is about polarization. Polarization is an interesting brand of hate. There's many brands of, brands of hate. Racism is when you hate someone because of their color of their skin, for example. Vengeance is another brand of hate. You hate someone because something that he or she did to you in the past. Polarization is also a kind of hate. It's when you hate someone because of their political worldview. Now, here's the thing. We all suffer from that. Uh, Right-wingers, left-wingers, when you see someone that has a different worldview than you, a different political affiliation, he's not, you're not always their fan. But the thing is that it got worse. And here's how worse. In 1995, Putnam describes, actually, it's not Putnam, but Putnam has similar data. Um, Right-wingers were asked, what do you feel towards left-wingers? And vice versa. Left-wingers, Democrats, liberals were asked, what do you feel towards Republicans, conservatives? What do you feel towards them? 100 is I'm head over heels in love. Zero is I absolutely hate them. And 50 is, you know, is parv. So the average was 42, 43 on both sides. Right-wingers didn't despise left-wingers. They didn't love them. It was a little bit less than lukewarm and vice versa. They did this again just a few years ago. The numbers went down from 45 to six. Suddenly, people start hating people from the other side. Right-wingers despise left-wingers. Left-wingers hate right-wingers. What happened? Well, something else happened. Another research shows the following finding. Right-wingers were exposed to opinions of the left about gay marriage, abortion, about different issues. And they were asked, listen, you're a right-winger, okay. How many of the opinions of the left are you willing to consider smart? Are you willing to adopt as your own? 
And the que- and left wingers were asked the same question. How many of you, okay, your identity, you're a left winger, you're a liberal, you're a Democrat, but out of the opinions of the right, how many opinions are you willing to adopt to see, say you agree with those opinions? And the question is, what percentage of the people will be able to identify with 20% of the views of the other side? In 1995, the numbers were about 35%. So in 1995, it was very possible to be a right winger that holds some of the left wing opinions, views, policies, and vice versa. They did that again today, two years ago. Right now, the amount of people that could do that are less than 5%. Boom, something happened in the world. Something not healthy happened in the world. Where once you have a political identity, that defines all your political thinking. If I'm a right winger, that means I buy the entire right wing package. If I'm a left winger, that means I don't even consider right wing opinions. Why? Because that's like somehow not being loyal to my left wing identity. Identity comes with a package of the whole package of ideas and opinions. Now this is polarization. This means we're shrinking. This means we don't like people that are from the other side and we're not curious about views of the other side. So our worlds are shrinking. They're shrinking sociologically. We don't like people from the other side and they're shrinking intellectually. Our opinions are only sterile, pure opinions of my side. We're shrinking twice, socially and intellectually. Keep this problem in mind. I want to introduce the Talmudic model of conversation. The Talmudic model. So the Talmud, it's a very interest is a very bizarre text. Here's why. The Talmud is a canon. It's our canonized text, especially the Mishnah. Okay, Google later on these terms if you're not acquainted with them. Just this is like our canonized text, right? Now, as Moshe Halbertal noticed and, and explains, roughly the same time where the Jews canonized their text, the Mishnah, the Romans canonized their law. And there's a very interesting difference. Here's the difference. The Mishnah is like this. The Mishnah is like this. Rabbi Akiva says X. Rabbi Shmael says the opposite. That's a Mishnah. <laughs> We're after Hanukkah, right? Hillel say, uh, Bet Hillel say, every night you, you add one more candle. Night number one, one candle. Night number two, two candles. Night number three, three candles. Beit Shammai says, no, the other way around. You start with eight, move to seven, move to six. That's it. Bet Hidel present their opinion. Beit Shammai present their opinion. That's it. What the Mishnah is, it's a canonization of an argument. In the Roman law, there must have been arguments between Roman scholars. But what they canonized was the conclusion, was the law that was born out of the argument. The Jews didn't do that. They didn't canonize the law. They canonized the argument about the law. And this obviously creates an interesting paradox because by canonizing not the law, but the argument, you're making not the law, but the argument sacred. The debate becomes something important. Now, here's where it gets weird because canon means it has authority. That's what a canonized text means. It carries authority. But here you have a canonization of a disagreement. Now, we all know what disagreements do to authority. They crack them, they undermine them. When my daughter tells me, asks her mom, my wife, Tsipi, mom, what time is bedtime tonight? And Tsipi says, 8.30. And then she asks me, <laughs> and she didn't tell me, she just asked the mom, dad, what time is bedtime? And I'm like, um, nine? Mom said 8.30, dad said nine. What did Avital, my daughter, what did she hear in her ears? What did she interpret in her mind? Mom said 8.30, dad said nine. What did she hear? I'll tell you what she heard, 12. <laughs> One, 
You know why? Because what you heard is that we don't have our act together. What you heard, there is no real policy here. What you heard, there is no real authority here. That's what you heard. That's what she experienced. That's what we know in the history of the psychology of authority. Authority always has to do as if it's un- as if as if it's clear and it's unanimous. Disagreement undermines authority, which le- brings us to the paradox of the Talmud, the canonization of a disagreement, canonizing, giving authority to a disagreement that undermines the authority itself. So this is very interesting, right? I mean, in Zoom, you never know if it's interesting. You can't feel the crowd. For me, this is an interesting idea, okay? I'm all alone here. Now, but thanks for smiling. The people who are in front, thanks for smiling. Now, now, but that's not the entire story of the Talmud. The Talmud also has halacha. Halacha is the laws that you obey. Now here's a double expectation of Jewish tradition from its sons and daughters. The Jewish, Jewish tradition expects its sons and daughters to do two things. One, to study Torah. We're commanded to study Torah. And here's the weird thing. Studying Torah traditionally doesn't mean studying Tanakh. Doesn't mean studying Bible. It means studying Talmud. So the tradition expects us to study these disagreements. And by the way, if anyone ever visited a hardcore yeshiva, so you see how traditionally Talmud is learned, you see couples and they're studying Torah, but Talmud, what we're doing, they're arguing about the meaning of the Talmud. They're arguing in the Chevruta. So what they're doing, they're arguing about the meaning of an argument. So they're not only studying Talmud, they're also imitating the Talmud. They're expanding the Talmud. This is the tradition of an ongoing, passionate argument. What does this have to teach us about a world that lost its ability to argue? Lost its ability to participate in a vibrant debate? So here's, I think, what? Because on the one hand, tradition asks us to study Talmud, to study the debate, to study both sides, to master both sides. On the other hand, and at the same time, tradition expects us to obey the law. Now, here is the thing. Follow me through. This is the trickiest point. The law is always according to one side. Like we said before, there's a disagreement between Hillel and Shammai. And halacha is accor- like in Hanukkah candles. And halacha is according to Hillel. We're supposed to start with one candle, move to two, move to three, move to four. That's what the halacha. So I'm supposed to practice halacha and study Talmud. If I put that together, that means I'm supposed to study views that I'm not allowed to live by. Let me say that again. When you put the intellectual part of Judaism with the practical part of Judaism, studying Talmud and obeying halacha, what comes out is the following. I'm supposed to study views that I'm not allowed to live by. I'm supposed to know the opinion of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael, and then listen only to Rabbi Akiva. Of Hillel v'Shamai, and then only Hillel. Abai v'Rabba, and I can't remember which one. And one of them. So I think Rava. So, so, or, or doesn't matter. So you're supposed to, you're expected to study ideas and opinions that you're not allowed to live by. What does this mean? This means that your intellectual world has to be broader than your practical world. This is the structure that Jewish tradition is creating. How would that look like today? Let's say, practically, I let's say I'm a Republican, which means I support the Republican Party, and it means I am active in, I'm not American enough to give you examples. I'm active in Republican causes. I'm a very active right winger. But I read books by Democrats. I listen to podcasts by liberal, interesting thinkers. And I go to lectures of interesting left wingers. Peak why? because my intellectual world has, has a lot of left in it, my practical world is only right wing. Or vice versa, right? I'm an active liberal, and I'm very curious about Republican worldviews. I'm reading their books, listening to their podcasts, going to their lectures, searching for the, lect- for the lectures on, on YouTube, because my intellectual life is rich and diverse. My practical life is narrow. That's the Talmudic model. And here's my question, and I think we all know the answer. Are we living in a Talmudic world? 
polarization I was mentioning before means we're living in an anti-Talmudic world. What does that mean? It means that I'm curious about the views I already have. I listen to, I'm a liberal, I listen to podcasts by liberals. I'm, I, uh, I'm a right-winger, I see videos mocking left-wingers. The intellectual world I'm a part of is the size of my opinions, which means my entire left, my entire intellectual world it shrinks to the size, to the narrow size of my practical behavior. I'm a right-winger, so the books I read are right-wingers. I'm a left-winger, so the ideas I'm thinking about are left-wing ideas. The tragedy of a polarized world is that it's an anti-Talmudic world. And here's a big question. How do we bring the Talmud back to life? So this was my opening question. Opening question about how our in a polarized world, we need a lot, we need to revive the spirit of the Talmud. By the way, the Talmud, not the Bible. Not the Bible. The prophets spoke with passion and conviction and they were right and everybody else was wrong. The Talmud is about a debate. I'm speaking, I think we all are prophetic today and, and, and Facebook, by the way, helps us be very prophetic. But the, the model of the Talmud, of being curious and studying and learning opinions you're not going to support and live by is a very healing model. Now, that was my opening thought. And I'm leaving to you to continue thinking about this. What I want to do now is to present my work in Catch 67. What I tried to do in Catch 67 was to try to create, to take the Israeli burning issue of the future of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and to try to understand this debate Talmudically, in the sense of listening to both sides and presenting both sides, giving them the best arguments. This is Talmudic. This is also, there's um, uh, Carol Gilligan, a very important contemporary writer and feminist in the United States. She speaks about radical listening. We need so much radical listening. I think radical listening is what the Talmud does. So Gilligan, she writes about what is radical listening? Think about the following. Usually when you meet someone, and let's say they're from the other side, you're a left winger and he or she are right wingers. So what we do is intuitively, we can't control it. When they're talking, we're thinking, why are they wrong? Why are they wrong? What did they, they're... yes, that's how we think. Imagine doing the opposite. When you listen, to, you meet someone and you ask yourself, why are they right? Why are they right? What's the depth? What's the strength? What's the light in what he or she is saying? Radical listening. I personally believe, by the way, we grow spiritually intellect and, and intellectually through the practice of radical listening. I think that's what the Talmud tries to, to teach us. To teach us, how, it trains our minds to practice radical listening. What I tried to do in Cat Sixty Seven was exactly that: to practice radical listening to the right and to the left. Now. What I'll try to do now, in the, some, some of the time I have, I want to make, to present the, the most, the best arguments of the Israeli right and the best arguments of the Israeli left. I want to ask something from all the great people of Minneapolis that are here tonight or, or wherever, all over America. that are here, not tonight. I know, I have to be a radical listener. It's your world in the, this, 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 this uh, snowy morning. I want to ask you, when I present the right or the left, some of you have strong convictions. And I want to ask you to practice radical listening. If you're a right winger and I'm presenting a left wing worldview, try to liberate yourself from your opinion and say, hey, why are they right? I miss, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. I miss inviting in Hebrew, you say, it doesn't cost money. Yes. I want to invite you to practice radical listening. Okay, so um, if you are a living audience, I would ask you, where should I start, right or left? Um, you're not a living audience. So I think I'm gonna start with the left. Just, I don't know. And I just wanna be very mindful of the time that I don't present only the left and then not the right. And then people will say, hey, you were biased. So I have now, okay. 
So very briefly, let me try to present the best arguments of both sides. I just want you to know, when you're thinking, does he believe in this? The answer is yes. I believe in everything I'm going to present, even though there are going to be both sides. When we, when we think about the best arguments of left-wing ideology in Israel, now in my book, I discuss the biography of left-wing ideology from socialism to peace. It's very, very interesting. But now I'm just going not to the ideology, but to the most, their best arguments. So in the West Bank, on different levels, what's hap what happens in the West Bank is there there's at least 2.5 million Palestinians the question, the, the question who counts and how you count, but this is a very minimalistic number, 2.5 million Palestinians, that large chunks of their life are not controlled by themselves. Large chunks of their lives are controlled by the Israeli military. Now that situation where there's a military regime controlling major parts of the life of civilian population. Oh, and that reg military regime was not sent there by a government chosen by that civilian population. I hope you follow me, all the pieces. That's occupation. Let me say this again. When there is a military regime that wasn't elected by civilian population that controls large parts of the life of that civilian population, that's, that's occupation. And now this is, I, I wanna be very, very blunt here. It's immoral. And when I say it's immoral, it's also anti-Zionist. Why is it anti-Zionist? Zionism was always about national liberation. That's what Zionism was about. The Jewish people made an argument that every nation has the right for self-governance, self-determination, to control its own life and not being controlled by another empire like the Ottoman Empire or the Austro-Hungarian Empire or whatever, or the British Empire. And we have the right to control our own lives, not to be controlled by a different nation. And Zionism is an implementation of that idea. That's the, that's the reason why Woodrow Wilson joined World War I. Liberation of nations from control of other nations. And Zionism was born as a result of World War I. It was an implementation of that universal value that nations are free to govern themselves. Now, just hear me through this argument. If Zionism is based on national liberation and the West Bank, there's occupation. So, the West, so occupation is anti-Zionism because a movement that liberates its own nation could not take the liberty from another nation. So what it is, it's anti, it's not Zionistic. It's also not biblical. It's not Jewish. We could go there. I go there in my book. I won't go there now. But 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 it's important because many times people people say the right st speaks for Zionism and the left for humanism. No, the left wing argument is Zionism. It's the heart of Zionism, national liberation, and a Zionism that occupies is an oxymoron. Um, now let me take this argument from a ethical Zionist Jewish argument, which is very important, to the demographic argument. And the demographic argument sounds like this. If Israel continues to control 2.5, or in some numbers, 2.8 million Palestinians in the West Bank over time. So a few things are going to happen. Eventually, the Palestinians are going to be change their national movement. And from a movement that's asking for a state of their own, they're going to start asking for being a part of Israel, they want one, like one man, one vote to vote for the Knesset. And then how can we say no, we're controlling their lives. The only reason we get away with not getting, not getting them citizenships is because they don't want it. For them, it's an abomination to be citizens of Zionism. But there'll be a moment. And among young Palestinians, that moment is very, very close that they'll change their battle. And then we're in real trouble because we'll be trapped in an impossible dilemma. If we give them citizenship, Israel won't be a Jewish democracy anymore. Just the numbers amount to a binational state, not the nation state of the Jewish people. The end of Zionism. It's not a Jewish state anymore. And if we don't give them citizenship, we're not a democracy anymore. Anyway, you look at it, 
It's the end of Zionism as we want it, love it, and are willing to fight for it. So the only way to protect our national majority and our traditional values is to leave the West Bank. Staying in the West Bank, controlling 2.56 million Palestinians is threatening our values and threatening our future. I, for myself, I am very persuaded by these arguments. And I hope right-wingers among you manage to practice a radical listening while I presented them and not, how is that possible? Okay, okay. So let me, let me now, um, let me now please change sides, okay? Not change sides, this is me also. Okay. When we think about the history, not, I wanna present the most important argument of the Israeli rights. Now, there's three things we have to take into consideration when we think about Israel security. Demography, geography, and history, okay? Let's start with a very basic demographic fact. I'm pretty sure all the people that are here could imagine the map of Israel. I'm gonna use my hands now to try to imagine how does the map of Israel look like within the 1967 borders, within the green line, okay? So it's pretty wide up north and pretty wide in the south. When I say wide, I mean Israel size wide. I'm not saying, you know, yeah, you guys are in something. Okay, well, I'm saying Israel and Israeli standards, right? So it's pretty wide, like from Haifa to the Kinneret, it's pretty wide. And from Ashdod to um, the Arava, to the, the Dead Sea, it's pretty wide. But right in the middle, it's very, very narrow. From Tulkarim on the green line, to the Mediterranean, it's 11 kilometers. Now, how much is that in miles? That's like, what, seven miles. That's a very, very narrow country. So we have as a country that's wide in the north, wide in the south, and very narrow in the middle. And here's the problem. Where do most Israelis live? Where do they all live? 60% of Israelis live somewhere between Gdera and Chadera. Like somewhere between like up north is Gdera, uh, no, there's Chadera and the south is Gdera, which means almost all, like, you know how you fly over when you enter, God willing, after COVID, you'll be coming to see Israel again and you fly over and you look beneath and you see all these, you, Israelis think that Givataim and Ramat Gan and Tel Aviv and Bnei Brak and Kiryat Ono, they're separate cities. They're all separate cities. But when you fly over, you realize these aren't separate cities. This is all, oh, Rishon and Batyam and Chulon, it's all one great, there's a word I'm missing, metropolin. How do you say metropolin in English? Um, um, met metropolis. It's all, and it's the highest population, concentration of Jews in the world. It's against the vision of Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion wanted us to spread out. But we decided we want to claustrophobic, we want to just be as close as we can, smushed somewhere in the broader Tel Aviv area. So these are two facts. Israel is wide in its center in the 1967 borders. And that's we have 70% of Israeli economy, 70% of its culture, 60% of its population. Okay. By the way, by the way, um, another important fact the Israelis that live on the shore in the Tel Aviv area are not only very close to the green line, they're also beneath. The mountains of Samaria go up to 800 meters and Tel Aviv is sea level and the shore is sea level. Okay, so now we have the demography and the geography. Where does this meet history? So very, very briefly, in 2005, Israel left Gaza, evacuated all the communities living in Gaza, taking out the entire military from Gaza and our entire intelligence presence in Gaza. A year and a half later, Hamas takes over Gaza. And as a result, missiles start falling in the area that's in the periphery of Gaza. Like if you're living roughly 15 kilometers from Gaza, your life is miserable, psychologically speaking. Because if on average, a Qassam, a missile falls in your community once a month, you say, oh, it's month to month, not a big deal. Yes, you don't know what, 
what day that is. Maybe today, maybe now is Misal Day. And people are living in constant, constant anxiety. And not living, it's so, and there's 60,000 Israelis living in the periphery of Gaza. So here's a question that many Israelis know how to ask. We left Gaza and all the Israelis living in the periphery of Gaza, their life became miserable. Listen through. If we leave Judea and Samaria, all the Israelis living in the periphery of Judea and Samaria, their life might also become miserable. But in the periphery of Gaza, we have 60,000 Israelis. In the periphery of the West Bank, we have 6 million Israelis. Almost all Israelis live in the periphery of the West Bank. All, almost all our economy, our cultural centers. So um, most Israelis think leaving the West Bank is a crazy risk. Repeating Gaza, where the stakes are so high in the West Bank, is something that it's just something irresponsible. So that's where, so that's where geography meets history. The borders of Israel being so narrow, meet 2005, you have a conclusion. Now I want to have meet history one more time, 2011. In 2011, the, um, um, the Middle East started, went through an earthquake, a geopolitical earthquake. At the beginning, they called it the Arab Spring. It was very optimistic. But what happens was forces of chaos were unleashed, later on fueled by, a, by radical uh, Islam. And a lot started happening. But the most important thing that happened was nation states started collapsing. And Yemen collapsed, and there were two revolutions, a revolution, a counter-revolution in Egypt and Tunis and Libya. Libya, Sud Gehenom, Libya's heart is, 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 uh, is, is, is dysfunctional. And Iraq is civil war in Syria. Syria is Bashud Gehenom. Syria is it's horrible, horrible what's happening and the amount of suffering in Syria and chaos and suffering and, and, and brutality happening in Syria and anybody fighting anyone else. So it's interesting. 2011, a wave of chaos swept the Middle East. So Henry Kissinger, in an article he did, in an interview he did in 2016, The Atlantic, to Jeffrey Goldberg, he had the following me metaphor. He said, in 2011, there was an earthquake, a geopolitical earthquake. Now, in a regular earthquake, every building that's not very stable collapses, right? In a geopolitical earthquake, every country that's not very stable collapses. And countries we thought were stable, like Syria and Iraq, collapsed. So Kissinger asked, is now the time to create a Palestine? Is now the time when nation states are collapsing? Is now the time for a new, fresh nation state? And if strong countries we thought were strong collapsed, will a new Palestine survive these forces? And what if it won't? What if it will collapse? What if it will be dysfunctional? And by the way, we have a good, we even have a precedent in Gaza. What would happen if the gamble doesn't work and it becomes dysfunctional and not very sovereign like other countries in the Middle East, which were more stable than, the, which, which have a tradition, political tradition, as opposed to the Palestinians. Who will enter the vacuum of sovereignty in the West Bank? Who will enter? enter? So as an Israeli intelligence officer told me, ISIS, Qaeda, proxies of Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, Putin will probably try to put something there, a cocktail of all the forces of chaos in the West Bank, 15 kilometers from the Mediterranean. This is a very powerful argument. You see, the old argument of the Israeli right was something like this. The strong Palestine, armed with advanced weapons, will attack Israel from its borders. The new argument, the better argument, the updated argument is what threatens Israel is not a strong Palestine, but a weak Palestine. Not a strong Palestine that will attack us, but a weak Palestine that can govern itself, a dysfunctional Palestine. And I have to admit, this argument persuades many Israelis, it persuades me too. So where does that put us? The demography, most Israelis on the shore, the geography, very close to the green line, Meets history, 
2005, leaving Gaza. 2011, realizing that nation states are not sustainable at this day and age. Where does that leave us? Following conclusion, we can't leave the West Bank. <laughs> if we leave the West Bank, we are taking a massive, massive risk on our national security. Where does that put me? What I just tried to do was to pr practice radical listening to the best argument of the left and the best argument of the right. If you listen to the left, you realize we can't stay in the West Bank. It's not Jewish, it's not Zionism. And if we stay in the West Bank, it's the end of Zionism. We have no future. If you do practice radical listening to the right, you realize if we leave the West Bank, we're risking our lives and we have no future. So if you do this Talmudically, if you're willing, some of you might say, you know what, the left got it wrong. Okay, fine. Or the right, yeah, fine. But if you're willing to practice radical listening, to try to address Talmudically the debate, we realize both sides got, I think we realize, got something right. And the result is a catch. Remember catch 22, right? Where there's, you know, there's a guy, he wants to stop flying. And the good news is um, he feels like he's losing his mind. The catch is if he tells his commanders he's losing his mind, they'll see him so sober and self-aware. He has it all together. He has to continue flying. <laughs> so the only thing that will help him, that will enable him not to fly is a thing that will guarantee he'll continue flying. And the term catch 22 became this absurd logical situation where there's a problem and the only solution increases the problem. I think that's where we are. That's where most Israelis are. Where we have a problem, we can't stay in the West Bank. We can't stay in the West Bank. Thank God there's a solution to leave the West Bank. <laughs> the problem is we can't leave the West Bank. That's a catch 22, or what I call catch 67. And it's a product. Understanding this catch is a product of practicing radical listening or Talmudic listening to both sides of this debate. I'm sure there's a lot of questions and I'm willing to answer every one of them, including to tell to you how I think we, we can move forward. I don't think we're paralyzed. Before we try to think about solutions, I think we should deeply appreciate the size and the magnitude of the problem. That was my spiel. Thank you. That sounds amazing. I, I'm on the edge of my seat, even having read Catch 67, if you could just say another few more uh, words about what you do propose in, okay. in response to this catch. Okay, so it's a little bit more than a few words, okay, Rabbi? It's a little bit more than a few words. Okay. So first of all, um, I believe um, before you fall in love with a, with a solution, you have to fall in love with the problem. I wanna appreciate this problem. And I think we don't appreciate the size of the problem. I think when America, many times, I, I don't wanna, many times Americans think it's, why don't you just solve that thing down there? <laughs> like, and the Israelis are like, it's, this is a very, it's very, very complicated. But I think I tried to capture the, the, the complication and, and, and as a result of, of radical listening. I think Israel has to do three, th we have to do three things if you want to move forward. One, we have to be willing to accept the fact that we can't solve the problem. But the fact that we can't solve the problem doesn't mean that we're, that we're paralyzed and we can't do anything. On the contrary, we can't solve the problem and there is so much we can do. There's so much we can do. Here's, um, I want to offer a metaphor here. Um, I'm from, I mean, I'm Orthodox from. So, so from people, we have this problem that we think about religion using binary categories. So like, um, like for example, if uh, someone decides that he or she are fasting on Yom Kippur, for the first time in their life, and they manage, you know, not to have dinner and after Kol Nidre and wake up in the morning, they don't drink coffee, they skip breakfast. There is a moment in two o'clock in the afternoon where, you know, in a fast where your, your, your mouth is very dry. So they realize no one's looking. They take a glass of water. They drink a glass of water. They go back to show. They continue fasting. The fast is over. Okay. So you ask a from Orthodox Jew. Okay. You say, 
she, he, she didn't fast. <laughs> that wasn't fasting, she didn't fast. Now you compare, when you use this binary thinking, either you fast or you don't fast. Now, obviously that person and a person who had a great dinner and a great lunch and a great, you know, was noshing in between, they had a different day. Psychologically, they had a different day. Spiritually, they had a different day. Sociologically, they had a different day. Halachically, they had the same day. They both didn't fast. Why? Either you fast or you don't fast. Now, religion loves dichotomies. Uh, if it's not Kodesh, if it's not sacred, it's Chol. How do you say Chol? Um, um, mundane. The, if it's not holy, it's ordinary. Ordinary. If it's not forbidden, it's prohibited. And if it's not, so like religion is always about, if it's not pure, it's impure. Religion is binary. What happens? Here's, I think, the biggest question we need to ask. So, okay, but by the way, what's not binary? Art. Art. If I say, I think this song of um, my girls are, are, are asking me to teach them the songs I grew up on. So I'm teaching them about Tears for Fears. <laughs> shout, shout, let it all out. Okay, so that's my problem. Okay, so you, you remember that song? These are the things. Okay, so let's say, say, I don't think it's an inspiring song. That doesn't mean I think it's a disgusting song. Maybe it's a great song, just not inspiring. Maybe, maybe it's a nice song. Maybe it's an okay plus song. Maybe it's a not bad minus song. You see, when it comes to music, if it's not beautiful, it doesn't mean it's disgusting. It just might mean it's just less beautiful. When you think about art, we don't think in, in, in dichotomies, we think in degrees. We think about, through, about religion, we think in dichotomies. These are two different ways of thinking. Now here's, I think the most important question we have to ask about politics. It's the following. The most important philosophical question we could ask about politics and not only about our politics in Israel. How do we think about politics? Like we think about art or like we think about religion or like from people think about religion. Because many times our pro when we think about pro politics, like we think about religion. So first of all, it creates polarization because there's only two options. And if you're not with me, you're against me. And it creates all these false, bind these false dichotomies. But also what it does, it it's, uh, limits our creativity. Because for example, when it comes to the conflict, there's two options. Either we solve the problem, the conflict, or you don't do anything about the conflict. And that's the two options we have in Israel. Netanyahu leads a school called manage the conflict, which means keep things the way they are. And the left says, end the conflict, end the conflict. That's binary thinking. Those are really the two options we have. Either you end the conflict, which is impossible, I think, by the way, or you keep things the way they are, but it's not sustainable, I think, by the way. Like, think about car accidents. No one is saying, let's end car accidents. And if someone would say, let's end car accidents, the alternative won't be, well, we can't do that. So let's not do anything about car accidents. That's absurd. When you think about crime, no one is saying, let's end crime. And if someone would say that, the alternative won't be, well, let's not do anything about crime. No, you try to shrink the amount of crime. That's all you do. Try to shrink the amount of car accidents. I propose, let's not end the conflict. Let's shrink the conflict. So I want to, now, what does it mean to shrink the conflict? It means to create a reality that won't end the conflict. I don't think I'm willing to explain why I think we can't end the conflict in this generation. If, but I explain it in the book, or I'll be happy to answer this question later on. What does it mean to shrink the conflict? It means to create a reality where Israel doesn't control, controls the Palestinian, life is Palestinians, much less than it does today, but without taking security risks, without being threatened by them more. Will it end the conflict? No. But will it uh, somehow neutralize the demographic threat without replacing it with the security threat? Yes, that's, I think, what we, what we, could, what we could do, is, is try to minimize the demographic threat without replacing it with a security threat. And how do we do that? That might be other questions. I also wrote an article about this called Eight Steps to Shrink the Conflict. It was published in The Atlantic. You, you're, you're invited, to, you're, you're, you're invited to, to read. But I think that's how we should start thinking. We should start thinking about politics, not like we think about religion, like how we think about music, like we think about art. And I start asking how do we shrink the conflict, not how do we solve the conflict.
Thank you so much, Micha Goodman. Um, I really encourage people to read Catch 67. It, it's, it, it's really insightful and I really appreciate how you lay out um, what you're talking about, trying to summarize really briefly here. And it's a little more complicated than that. Um, I also wanna just take a minute to reflect on the members of our community who are gathered here and how we in this moment are modeling this kind of radical listening. I see people from all the way across the political spectrum gathered on this one call and really thank the Federation and Micha Goodman for setting up this forum where we can begin to be in conversation with one another across these issues that are clearly really loaded for so many of us for good reason. Um, Rabbi Davis submitted this question before, uh, before your talk today. What is or will be the impact of the Abraham Accords on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? And if you can just give a sentence of context for that, that would be great. Great. So for many, many years, uh, let's say ever since Oslo, their path to peace was looked like this. Israel has to solve the conflict with the Palestinians. And after there is peace between Israelis and Palestinians, and peace is always a formation of a, a democratic Palestine living side by side by democratic Israel, two states for two nations, the result of that peace will be peace between Israel and the Arab world. So peace of the Arab world will be a result of the peace between Israelis and Palestinians. This idea, this paradigm, which was a vision in Oslo in 1993, became very much alive in 2002, I think it's 2001 or 2002, the Saudi initiative, the Arab League voted for an initiative by King Salman, not MBS, the dad, the father, King Salman, that said that, that if Israel will um, leave entirely the West Bank to the Green Line and solve the refugee problem and find a, a, um, a, a shared solution for the refugee problem of 48. If you want, I can go into that also, but uh, it's all so complicated. So the Arab League will make peace with Israel. So that was the paradigm. Peace with Palestinians first, Arabs later. The Ar peace with Arabs will be a result of peace between Israelis and Palestinians. The Abraham Accords, very surprising, because suddenly now there is the beginning of a peace process and more and more countries are joining between Israel and Arab countries and without the Palestinians coming first. So this is maybe a, re now there is hope that while the Palestinians always had a veto power, they could say, listen, no Arab country can make peace with Israel until they make a deal with us. That gave them a lot of leverage. And all that leverage turned their positions in the negotiations to positions where they um, they couldn't accept any Israeli offer, not Barak's, not Clinton's, not Ehud Olmert's. They didn't accept any Israeli offer. That's the history. So maybe this is the only hope. I don't know. This is the only hope. Um, the fact that they have less leverage now because they're not, you know, they can't veto, like Israel is already developing a relationship with the most important Arab countries. So now they have less leverage. Maybe that could lead to an opening of more of, of maybe, maybe Israel and Palestinians could, um, could be more, could, could get closer to discussing something that works. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask one more question and then a lot is gonna uh, highlight one of our participants. Um, in your talk today and in Catch 67, you talk about this, you know, intractable paradox. Um, and one of the places in the United States um, dialogue around Israel, where many in the center and right shut down is when the language of colonialism is used by the left regarding Israel. Um, in this case, as Sammy uh, really helpfully framed up, we have one indigenous people, one indigenous population that was displaced by another indigenous population. How do you respond to those among us who consider Israel another colonialist project 
and who, you know, especially in a context where people don't necessarily have the time or attention for a full historical context. Yes, um, the, the truth is um, some things, I mean, what you could do is you could always take a word, expand its meaning, and then it includes other phenomena. Like my keepa is a table. Really, it's a table. I could put things on it and it's a table. We, we could always expand words. And if you expand the term colonialism so much that Israel fits, but probably anything else will fit. The thing is, colonialism assumes that um, you know, the, the project of colonialism was European powers sending settlers to Africa, to Asia, in order to somehow uh, rob their, their um, resources and send them back to Europe. To think that Israel is somehow a European colony. When people know history, we kind of know that the Jews were not set. Jews are the orphans of Europe. The Jews are the victims of Europe. And to turn it around that we are the messengers of Europe in the Middle East, when all we try to do is to create a safe refuge from the violence of Europe, that's just completely confusing history. I have nothing else to say about that. That's one thing. And it's just, I just don't even know what to say, right? And, and, um, and, and there's a second thing that most that American Jews have a hard time understanding. In America, Sfaradi, Jew, Sfaradi Jews, Jews that come from the Middle East, are I think 10% of American Judaism, maybe 15%. So American Judaism is primarily Ashkenazi Judaism. It's primarily European Judaism. And many times what you do is when you live in a certain surrounding, you project, you think also the other Jews. But Israel is not Ashkenazi. Ashkenazim in Israel are, I think, less than 50%. Most of the Israelis are, are, Mizra, are Sfaradi, which means they're Middle Eastern. So even the, like, so, so the Ashkenazim are the orphans of Europe. But the Sfaradim are not even European. They're Middle Eastern. And not only the Middle Eastern, from Egypt, from Tunisia, from Syria, from Halib, from Iraq, from Morocco. They're refugees. They're refugees. They escaped. So, so what we have here, so the thought that it's a European project, first of all, denies the fact that 50% of Israelis did not immigrate to the Middle East. They immigrated within the Middle East when they were refugees in the Middle East. So it's just, so, so you're asking the question, how, how is it possible? So... Was there violence here? Yeah, there were a lot of things. There were aspects you could find in colonialism, but I think it's the opposite of colonialism. Thank you. So let's bring up someone from uh, the audience. Oren Gross has a question for you. Okay. Uh, Micha, toda raba. Uh, I read all your books, loved them all, uh, and uh, was convinced by the different perspectives that you <laughs> present in, in each of the books. Um, so I want to ask you kind of two follow-up questions on, on your presentation. Um, I, I completely agree with you about the notion of radical listening, but I want to push you to what extent um, you have actually lived up, at least in the presentation, and I know it's a truncated version, obviously, of, of the fabulous sketch 67, and to what extent you've done a, a radical presentation. That is, you presented um, the best cases for the left and the best case for the right, uh, but at least when you speak to an American audience here, the best case for the left seems very attractive in the sense that it speaks about ethics and it speaks about morality and also demographic, but when you spoke about the case for the right, you spoke about mostly security. Um, surely there are also ethical and moral arguments on the right. And uh, to some extent, you're giving a short shrift, right? In this uh, uh, radical conversation, maybe, to the best argument of the right. So I wanted to push you on this. The second question that I wanted to ask you goes to kind of the general issue of the, uh, the spirit of the Talmud. Because if you think about the spirit of the Talmud, most, most, not all, but the vast majority of the arguments and the discussions in the Talmud are internal. They're internal and they assume a community of people who agree in general to uh, the framework of argumentation, 
to the framework of disagreement, uh, to the framework of uh, an exchange. Uh, what happens when you put that spirit of internal disagreements into a, uh, a scenario and a real a practical scenario where you're not the only game in town, where you're dealing with uh, other communities that might not share the same uh, general perspective, the same general framework, and do not necessarily accept the notion that um, conversation and disagreements are to be uh, uh, as respected as the, as the perspective that you put forward. Thank you. I have a question. Would it be fair to say, Oren, that your second question, you're thinking about the United States? You're, can we please unmute uh, Oren? Yes, now they, now they allow me. No, I, I'm actually thinking, uh, for example, about the scenario, if you think about the scenario in the Middle East, one argument is it's all nice and well to have right and left and to have the right and left argumentation in Israel, but you have communities around that don't exactly accept the same type of uh, uh, framework. Thanks. Yes, great, great. So these are two very, very powerful questions. Let me, um, the, the, the first one is a deep, it's a very deep question. I'll, I'm gonna answer this very briefly and in a, in a way that hopefully that uh, to, you can continue th to, to, uh, to unpackage this. When we think about rights, we think about national rights, rights of nations to govern themselves. We also think about human rights, rights of individuals, and they're very separate. National rights have to do with World War I, human rights have to do with World War II, two different projects. Uh, but, uh, oh, I just wanna say, Oren challenged me to build an ethical argument for the right. I gave an ethical argument for the left, and he feels like it's not fair. I didn't give an ethical argument for the right. So for Oren's case, and so for us to have intellectual fun tonight, I'm gonna to offer an ethical argument for the right, okay? So um, I'm not sure what I think about this argument. It's a very interesting argument, but I'll present it, I'll present it as, uh, with the best I can. So we have two kinds of rights. Now, would it be fair to say but if Israel leaves the West Bank, it's actually risking human rights. Now, why would that be fair to say? Because when Israel left Gaza, after Yenath Hamas took over Gaza, and human rights collapsed, it's gay rights, it's, 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 um, it's I, I, the stories about, about what's happened, what Hamas do to gay people in Gaza are horrifying. Christians are leaving Gaza, secular people trying to escape Gaza, um, uh, people from the Fatah that don't agree with Hamas. So, so freedom of expression. So, so, so Israel left Gaza and as a result, human rights collapsed. So you could say two things. When we left Gaza, their national rights, their ability to govern themselves rose. But after a year and a half, Hamas took over and their human rights were diminished. So is it fair to say that if Israel does the same in the West Bank, we can't make any, you know, with only, we can only speak with probabilities, we can't speak for sure. It's possible that what happened in Gaza will repeat itself in the West Bank, which means we're risking the human rights of people in the West Bank, which means now, so you might say, someone might say, okay, that's paternalistic, give them national rights, they'll take care of their human rights. But by you saying that, you're saying that national rights are more important than human rights. And some people call that fascism. So the, so the only way to argue that Israel should, should stay in the West Bank, should, should leave the West Bank and increase Palestinian national rights, knowing that you're risking human rights is by saying that national rights are more sacred than human rights. And that's something that almost all left peop, left-wing people oppose. So here you have, I think, an interesting argument, a right-wing argument, which is based on values and ethics and rights. Okay, Oren? Now, regarding your second question, which I forgot what it was, it was an important one. Oh, yes. I agree with you 100%. I don't think that there is a Talmudic debate between Israel and Hamas, okay? All I'm trying to do is to create a Talmudic debate between Israelis and Israelis. I don't think that there is a Talmudic debate right now with Hezbollah and Hamas. No, I don't think there's a Talmudic debate there. And I'm lis radically listening to uh, Nasrallah. No, I'm not that hippie-ish. I'm saying, 
within the framework of Israel and political rights and left in Israel, then that very narrow framework, yeah, I think there we could practice radical listening. When it comes to, uh, you know, to, um, to the manifesto of Hamas that thinks that, that the Jews started World War I and, and uh, all this anti-Semitism, I'm not going to practice radical listening there. Yes, it's more limited to ours. It's uh, what I'm trying to do is a Talmudic uh, approach towards the internal Israeli debate, not the um, not the cross Middle Eastern debate. Thank you. I, I think you answered the question from Rabbi David Thomas, which is what are the boundaries around radical listening? Must we at least agree that facts are indeed facts and not everything one says is actually true? And should we listen well to a liar? Do you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, radical listening assumes we share facts. It's very, very, because we have, we have to, radical listening means we all agree on words. And we agree on words, we can start arguing. But if we don't agree on words, if you say like, uh, if you think colonialism is so, uh, it's very hard to, because uh, we use language to argue. But if we don't agree on the language, we can't argue. They'll be just like a French person arguing with a, with a Chinese person. They're not arguing. So yes, we have to agree on facts. We have to agree on words. There are some, there are some basic perimeters that could enable a Talmudic debate. Thank you. Um, so here's another question from an audience member. It says, Micha, I find your solution compelling. How do you respond to the concern that your proposal is the luxury of those who hold the upper hand in a situation, saying the best we can do is to manage the conflict? How do we expect those who are suffering from the present reality to accept that? And what keeps them from further radicalizing with disastrous results for everyone? Well, uh, I, first, I just want to make, uh, I don't know who asked this question. I just want to say, I didn't say manage the conflict. I'm against managing the conflict. I'm for shrinking the conflict. Let me just make this Both clear. Both sides need to move. Yeah. What? Both sides need to move. No, shrinking the conflict is not, is not ending the conflict. I could say why I think we can't. We just can't end the conflict right now. But the alternative is not, not doing anything about it, which is managing the conflict. The alternative is there's a lot we can do to shrink the conflict. So let me just say something about shrinking the conflict. Shrinking the conflict would be reducing the amount that Israelis control Palestinians without reduce the amount that Palestinians could, could threaten Israelis. And I would say there's a lot of that. I mean, I would say if, um, if um, let's say the amount that Israelis control Palestinians, let's say 80 points, the amount of security Israelis enjoy is 80 points. What if I could tell you that we could reduce the amount we control Palestinians from 80 to 10, and Israeli security will go down from 80 only to 75? Would you agree for that kind of a move? We maintain the same level of security, would you agree? So, so this is not ending, it's not down to zero, it's down to 15, and it could be done. Freedom of, freedom of we're talking about freedom of movements. There's a lot, I won't go into it unless somebody wants me to go into it. I just wanna say one thing. Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we taking Palestinian autonomous, authority, uh, autonomous islands and connecting them to each other with a road and getting the Palestinians sovereignty over that ro road? Why aren't we fixing up al Anbi Bridge and enabling Palestinians to fly from, from Amman much easier? Why aren't we building a railroad tracks from Jenin to Haifa and having a Palestinian port so they can import and export on their own? Why aren't we increasing their amount of autonomy and limiting the amount that we control them without risking our security? Why aren't we doing that tomorrow morning? Not tomorrow morning, now. Why aren't we trying to do that now? I'll tell you why. Because, because of the myth of peace. If you believe that peace is around the corner, you're saying, we'll do all this when we have peace. Problem is, peace that's not coming means we're not doing any of this. We are paralyzed not only because of the myth of settlements. We're also paralyzed because of the myth of peace. Obviously, the myth of settlements are also paralyzing us. You can't give one inch and this road will take... That's right. But the, 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 what, what's surprising is that the myth of peace is paralyzing us. Because if anything you do on the ground to make, to make life much better... Let's do that when we have peace. Peace that's not coming mean we're not doing anything on the ground. So it's actually the myth of peace that's creating and managing the conflict. 
And it's when we give up, we realize, okay, peace is not going not to happen in this generation, not in this 10 or 10, 20 years. That's when you realize, okay, so now that I'm liberated, I don't have to ask what will bring peace. Peace is not coming. What can shrink the conflict? And now we can start being active and pragmatic on the ground. So there's two myths that lead to paralysis, sacred land, sacred peace. If we graduate from those two, two myths, now there's so much we can do to dramatically shrink the conflict. Gary Rappaport has a question. Yes. Um, there was a, a, a leader in the Palestinians named Fayyad a few years ago who was all in favor of building industry and cooperating with Israel, and he got fired. And um, I read almost daily reports from Palestinian Media Watch showing how the regime there is alienating its, its population against not only Israel, but Jews. I mean, it's really a strong negative push about, about, the, about Jews. And the question I have is, how do you change that dynamic and start building trust? I mean, I, I, you know, I have a business background, not a philo philo philosopher, okay? So I'd like to see more of the soda stream experiments or various kinds of projects that not only give jobs, but training, aspiration, sort of something to build trust. And I don't know where you even start with that. So what are your thoughts about that? Yes, I'm also a fan of Salam Fiyad. Very upset that Fiyad or Fiyadism didn't work. Yeah. Maybe, Fiyad, maybe Fiyadism will have a renaissance in a few years. We don't know. All I'm saying is that Israel, part of that peace paradigm that failed, there were 17 attempts to make peace. All 17 attempts failed. I don't think we should go on the 18th, even though it's high. I don't think that's, I think we should change our paradigm. I think because our attempt to make peace always freezes the status quo. Let's end with peace and start moving. Start moving on the ground. And by the way, I think right-wingers and left-wingers could agree on steps we can do on the ground. And you're right, um, Gary, that it's very upsetting um, the way the Palestinian Authority, the way it's guiding, the way it's teaching, the way it's educating, and the way it's, it's very upsetting. And you realize, hey, they, 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 it doesn't look like they want peace. So if I was a peacenik, I would say, you know, that's such bad news. But here's the power, divorcing our thinking from peace. So I wanna build a road that connects Palestinian autonomy to each other, not because I want them to love me. I wanna build a road that connects Palestinians, Palestinians autonomies, autonomies to each other because I want them to be more independent, more liberated from me, so I control them less. So the demographic threat that's threatening the, the future of Zionism is less of a threat. So, so if, when I'm in the business of making them love me, maybe this move, maybe, I don't even know. I don't even know. But I'm not in the business of them liking me. Once I'm not, the power of saying, once I'm not in the peace business, I'm in the shrinking the conflict business. So I don't care what they write about me. Because my assumption is I'll have to stay strong all the time. My assumption is there's no peace. And with that assumption, I want to start, but that assumption doesn't lead to paralysis, doesn't mean to man, man, doesn't lead to keeping things the way they are. It doesn't lead to managing the conflict. What well, that actually could lead to start doing steps on the ground, which don't, which don't um, uh, have within them any security risk. Thank you. I, I can see where agreeing to share the assumption that we're not going to have peace would be a way for us all to get back into conversation together. Um, I want to acknowledge the many more questions that came in that we are not able to get to in the time allocated for this, but if it's all right with you, I have one more closing question, yeah. which is, um, what does a shared future for the Jewish people look like? It's a big question. And, and is it a worthy goal? Is it realistic? What are your thoughts on that? When you say Jewish, so oh, you mean American Jews and Israelis? Yes. And yes, across across political divides. We have we have the across the ocean and we have across the political divides as well. Yes. 
So let's go back to shrinking the conflict for a minute. Here, here we have the following. We always, what happens after Israel makes re extreme changes on the ground, which is three main things, by the way, connects, builds a road system that connects Palestinian autonomous islands to each other. So they have freedom of movement, fix up the island bridge, so they're connected to the world and builds an important Haifa, so their economy is connected to the world. So none of these moves, these moves dramatically enhance Palestinian autonomy. And we can, right being as leftists can agree on them because there's no movement of settlements. There is no, nothing controversial and no movement of the IDF or the intelligence. So what happens then? Well, the, the interesting thing is that that then, let's say is 10 years. Let's argue about then, then. Can we start moving together on actions that we agree on? Instead of focusing our energy on what we don't agree on and then missing out, being paralyzed and not cashing in and not turning into policy, everything we can agree on, let's do the other way around. 10 years from now, we'll start arguing again about the future of the West Bank. But right now, if there's things we can agree on, let's do them together now. APAC and J Street, Israelis and Americans, right-wingers and left-wingers. I think that's what we need. And this is, I think, this is what I wanna call a halachic approach. I wanna just offer a, 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 a distinction between a prophetic approach and a halachic approach. If you read the prophets, the prophets are very binary. I, I mentioned this before, let me say one thing. First of all, prophet always speaks in the name of God. What he says is God. And the people who are preaching to, they're always, they're always Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, very, very dichotomous and very, very like passionate. You open the Talmud, the Talmud starts like this. What time are you supposed to say Shema in the evening? Until the time that the night shift of the priest is over. That's what Rabbi Yezel says. And the rest of the scholars says till midnight. So three things. One, there's not very, there's, they're not, the temperature is low. The temperature is low. Two, it's not, they're not preaching, they're talking. And three, they're not giving answers, they're asking questions. Today, Facebook is designed in a way that we all have absolute convictions and the other side is always a villain. And, and we, how do we bring the Talmud back? How can we not preach but talk? How can we ask questions and not answers? How can we take the temperature down? How can we make it interesting? Which takes me to maybe, maybe my most important point. John Dewey, the American philosopher, he said once, anxiety and curiosity or a response to the same thing, difference. If you see someone that's different than you, let's say you're a left wing and you're surrounded in a left wing bubble and you see a passionate Republican. So you can respond to that with anxiety. Why? It's so different. And you can respond with curiosity. Why? Because it's so different. So, so we heal our conversation, not through blurring difference, but through responding differently to difference. Actually, a polarized world is a world that lost its, lost its curiosity. We need a massive dose of curiosity. What I try to do in Cast 67 is to make it interesting. It's, the right is interesting, the left is interesting, the conflict is interesting. Let's make it less terrifying and more interesting. And uh, not persuading, not just interesting. And when we think about, uh, I believe that we should be touching the most, um, of the largest problems with small steps and creating a Talmudic debate about it and, and trying to educate our minds to respond to difference with curiosity. And our Jewish tradition has a lot to educate us and to guide us, but that's assuming that we're less prophetic and more Talmudic. 
Uh, okay, so this uh, wraps up our presentation. Thank you very, very much, Micha Goodman, for joining us. I hope you weren't too cold there outside on your uh, on your porch. Thank you very much to Rabbi Rapport for facilitating the discussion, and to JCRC and Steve Hunnix for always being a wonderful partner, and to the rabbis and synagogues, and most of all to you, to the community, for taking on this difficult topic and being willing to be open-minded, curious, asking questions, and um, finding a way to bring a united discussion rather than a divisive one. So Shavua Tov, everyone. Have a wonderful week, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you. And thanks to everybody who submitted questions. And the JCRC is Sammy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.